Hi there and welcome back. I'm here with Alex and we're going to be talking everything about sloths and the wonderful world of different animals and other life that lives on them. It's lovely to be here with you, Alex. Yeah, it's great to be here. So are the examples of kind of animals and other wildlife working together in nature, is that uncommon or is that something that happens a lot? No, so um, we see yeah examples of these kind of really tight knit interactions throughout like all of the natural world. When you have two organisms that live um, in close kind of proximity to each other for all or most of their lives, um, we call this a symbiotic relationship. Um, so some examples are, for example, uh, vascular plants um, around their roots will often have um, these networks of mycorrhizal fungi, um, and then you get nutri uh, nutrient transfer um, between them in both directions. So it's ben mutually beneficial to both parties. Um, and we call these mutualisms. Yeah. Other examples would be things like plant pollinators. Um, so the pollinators get the benefit from having nectar from the flowering plants, and the flowering plants benefit from having their um, pollen spread around and being able to reproduce. There are different types of relationships as well. So um, for example, you can have ones where one party benefits and the other um, it's neutral. So if it's something like an epiphytic orchid living on a branch of a tropical tree, the orchid obviously relies on the branch to provide support for it to grow, but the tree receives, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't harm the tree, but it just receives no benefit. And we call those commensalisms. Yes, and when it comes to sloths, like the beautiful specimen we have here, yeah. Algae seems to be the most important thing that's living in its fur, isn't that? Yeah, yeah. So the the fur of the um, sloth um, provides a really, really great environment for the algae to thrive in. So if you look at the um, if you just look at the hairs of the sloth under the um, under a microscope, you'll see all these like little cracks or grooves in the surface of the hair, um, which isn't something you see in other mammals. And these cracks um, can sort of trap moisture. So if you think about where sloths live, they live in like tropical forests in South America. So there's plenty of um, moisture in the air and the, you know, the fur almost acts, I guess, kind of like a sponge. It just, it, it creates a really wet, humid environment, which the algae then really, really thrive in. Um, and then that can give, if you look at sloths in the wild, you'll see, not this one, um, but they can, they'll have this like green tinge to their fur often. This relationship is kind of fascinating. So you get, you get species of algae, which are only found in sloths as well. So they're, um, so they're, the algae is thought to pass from potentially from the mother sloth to the baby sloth. And then the, right. the algae is, as I say, like, you know, they're, they're sloth specialists. That's the only place they're found. So yeah, it's a kind of really fascinating relationship because it's not really clear whether the sloth is getting any kind of benefit from this. Obviously the algae is getting a benefit because that's the only place they live. But what the sloth is getting out of the deal is kind of interesting because the fact that there's these species which are only found on sloths and the fact they have these like kind of little cracks suggests that maybe the sloth is like actually kind of co-evolving with the algae and actually encouraging its presence. But what it's getting out of it is yeah. not super clear. So there are some ideas. So the kind of obvious one, I guess, is that the green tinge is actually providing, it's like a form of crypsis. It's giving the, the, the sloths some camouflage. Okay. So they live up in the trees and they're kind of predators of things like eagles or there's a um, animal called a tyra, um, which is sort of muscular type thing. So giving a kind of green tinge um, could help the sloth kind of blend into its environment and avoid getting eaten. Yeah. Um, other ideas is that, so the algae I think has been shown to produce a kind of UV um, absorbing material. Uh, it's like a natural sunscreen. Yeah, basically, yeah, yeah it stops the sloth getting um, burnt. Um, other things is it could be, so there's some, um, the algae could just be kind of competing with um, other sort of, other uh, things that would harm the sauce, so it's like fungi that maybe would, you know, could, could, could have a del deleterious effect on this. So it's kind of like how you have like a, the bacteria on the surface of your skin um, is a sort of natural barrier to harmful bacteria. So it could be something like that as well. We don't, basically, we don't really know. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of ideas. Um, there's not really a lot of direct evidence for them. Um, so one kind of, uh, kind of more out there idea that's being suggested um, is that in the three toed sloths, um, you see a lot of these sloth moths, which is another, which is another um, species which is only found um, on in the fur of sloths. So yes, we actually have got some, some here. Yes. Yeah, we have some examples here. Um, so you can see those pretty unremarkable looking little brown moths um, that live. Yeah, they've only been found living in the fur of um, of the sloth. Uh, so what has been proposed, basically? Um, with the, as I say, with the three-fingered sloths, is a sort of kind of three-way mutualistic relationship. Okay. 
So these sloths, not this one actually, from this, this is a two-host sloth, but from the other genus of sloths, they will descend to the ground from the tree that they live in to defecate. Yeah. So then the moths will lay their eggs in the dung left by the sloth. And then when those um, larvae in the dung hatch, it's a great food source for them. And then when they um, turn into adult moths, they'll fly up into the canopy, find the sloth, and then live in its fur um, until the, so the cycle repeats itself. Yes. So what has been proposed that these moths, um, they will have their own leavings and so on, um, that could provide nutrients to the algae in the fur, so basically nitrogen. And then the final benefit then is from the algae to the sloth by eating it. Um, so people have suggested that the sort of sloths maybe kind of groom themselves like a cat um, yeah. or each other. Um, and so they'll, they'll, they'll ingest the algae basically. So yeah, so the sloth benefits the moth by defecating on the ground. And then the sloth benefits the algae, the algae benefits the sloth. That's the idea. And that would also help explain why sloths, the, the three finger sloths, go to the ground in the first place okay. um, to defecate because you can kind of see just by looking at them, they're uh, kind of pretty adapted for life in the trees and they're famously slow. They don't really move fast. So when they're on the ground, it's kind of a, you know, vulnerable position. it's a vulnerable position for them to be in. Yeah, they're kind of, it's, it's sort of on the surface is an odd thing for them to do. Um, so this would maybe help explain that. The trouble with this sort of proposed three-way mutualistic um, relationship, and to be fair, in common with the other proposed um, explanations for the algae is there's not really a lot of evidence for it. And in fact, there's some uh, sort of contradictory evidence. The main thing is that um, people who work and observe sloths in the wild say they don't groom themselves. Uh, <laughs> um, there's no, there's no <laughs> recorded evidence of them kind of doing the, you know, licking themselves like a cat or anything like that. Also, it's unclear whether the moths could really provide much benefit to the um, algae. Yeah, by you know, because they they will they'll they will leave some um, kind of nitrogen and stuff um, in the fur. But you know, whether it's enough to really promote algae in a kind of meaningful way is like not super clear. Yeah. So yeah, there's not kind of not loads and loads of evidence for this. Um, and in fact, probably poss probably not really true. But as I said, it's a, it's a pretty neat, nice idea. Um, but it really shows kind of. The difficulty, I would say, in kind of uh, understanding like what you know, what 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 these relationships are, and if these relationships exist, and what the benefit is. Um, I had a lecturer who sort of said to sort of beware just so stories okay. in evolution, where you kind of you you look at something and you think, oh well, that looks like that could be you know doing this. So like you know, it looks like the green tinge must be camouflaging the sloth. But in terms of actually like proving that that is what's happening, and that proving that the sloth is getting the benefit through that it gets very complicated quite quickly because then you sort of, ideally you'd want to do some kind of experiment where you're kind of manipulating the algae yes. levels and then looking at predation levels. And obviously these are wild animals and yeah, it gets complicated pretty fast, so. Yeah, and especially when they live so far up in the trees, I mean, it's yeah, for sure. quite difficult <laughs> yeah, to yeah, do yeah. anything up there. Yeah, any kind, of, any kind of manipulation is pretty much impossible. So yeah, it's, it's fascinating, but uh, basically there's a whole lot that we don't know. Yeah. Well, it's been absolutely fascinating talking to you about this. So thank you very much for your time, Alex. Oh, sorry. I was just looking for some more snacks in my fur. In the meantime, why not like and share this video and comment below to let us know what you thought. And remember to subscribe for more content from the Natural History Museum.